Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 173. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, I'm John Davis, of course, and around our table today, executive producer Brian Roberts. Hello. Glad to be here. Who doesn't usually show up for these, so we're delighted to have him with <laughs> us. Uh, our writer, researcher, uh, Garrick Zykin. Thank you for having me again. And let's see, we have online content coordinator Greg Carlos. Sorry to everybody who has to listen to me again. And video producer and editor <laughs> Mr. Joe Ligo. And right. Joe also is our producer of the podcast. Blame it on me. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot of cover. Uh, the main focus of this particular um, podcast is going to be the 2018 North American International Auto Show in Detroit. And I'm going to start off just by mentioning, uh, since uh, I'm one of the jurors for North American Car, Truck, and, S- and Utility of the Year, the winners, in case you've been living in a cave, because I think they actually even had a big billboard up in Times Square, um, the uh, Honda Accord won for Best Car, uh, the Volvo XC60 won for Best Utility, and the Lincoln Navigator <clears throat> one for best truck. Did you say and expedition or navigator? Navigator. Ooh. Navigator. navigator. Yeah. The Lincoln <laughs> Navigator. Uh, what happened with, in trucks this year is there was only one pickup truck contender, and both the Expedition from Ford and Navigator are built on a truck-style frame, and that's why they were included, and the Navigator took the win. Having said that, there were a lot of vehicles uh, at the show uh, of note, and we've got long lists, and we're going to try and get through most of them. But I thought I would start by just going around the table and say, okay, fellas, you, you get to the show, you've got a list of must-see cars. Where would you head first? Brian, take it away. Well, I, I would say something just so over the top, I thought, was the new Lamborghini Urus. It's even hard to pronounce. Can you say it again? Ur- Urus. Urus. <laughs> All the Lamborghinis. Urus. It's like Centenario. Yeah, everything's Uracan. hard to say. Huracan. But the Ur- Urus, the super SUV. It, um, you know, it was. It's. It's expected to. They're finally getting the SUVs. Um, it's expected to double their their all their yearly sales. Um, it's a two hundred thousand dollar SUV that packs six hundred and forty one horsepower, which is just ridiculous. They say it's the fastest mm-hmm. SUV, although it's a Track twin, Hawk twin made. turbo V eight. Twin turbo, yeah, V eight. Is that on the Q seven? Yeah, Q seven in the Cayenne. Yeah. Um, like three point nine zero to sixty, one hundred ninety. Yeah, it's just uh, ridiculous. But you know, things, but it actually looks. It, I it, it looks attractive. Nice. Yeah, a lot of technology. You know, a lot in of it. these high, super duper high end SUVs don't look very attractive. It has it a it has nice. an air suspension with the ground clearance uh, that um, tops some Jeeps. It's um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I just thought it was so over the top. It's definitely a must see. Leave it to the Italians to make something that looks good. And goes fast. Yeah. And goes fast. Yeah. We had more folks covering the auto show this year than we've ever had before, both there and back here. Garrett, you were holding down the Ford and making sure things got processed back here a lot. So from afar, what would you have said or what would you say was a must-see vehicle? I think the uh, Jeep Cherokee. Mm-hmm. Uh, the front fascia has changed. It's not the stacked lighting that it was before it's more conventional but it also gets a, a new engine a new turbocharged um four cylinder which the horsepower is similar with the v6 mm-hmm. but the torque is much higher so it'll be interesting so it's actually it's an optional engine but it's the most powerful engine correct basically that's yes, the one from correct. the new wrangler too yeah yeah so you know it's it's not only just some exterior changes but you also have some changes on the inside so i think that, that would be interesting they, they made the cargo area bigger right mm-hmm. and then they've also put what a um uh, foot activated tailgate is mm-hmm. it? Is a, it's so, definitely more attractive than the eighteen. Uh, oh, I yeah. I don't think well, there's any question. They yeah. took the the split yeah. lights and put them together, and right. seemed like they even moved it down the fender a little bit. It's, it's interesting because they did. They technically took that away, but I looked at it for a while, and the same basic design of the stacked lights right. is actually still there because they have a thin light, a thin LED runner at the very top of the what is now an actual headlight. And then they have the um, 
smaller fog lights below. So you still actually have the stacked look without it mm-hmm. actually being that yeah. an actual stacked. Which right. means that they basically yeah. didn't change the structure under it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, somebody yeah. in I engineering just, said, how can we redo it's, this it's on the cheap and, and make that, it look good? Maybe the reason I saw it was because it was kind of dark, so you're looking at the lighting, and you still see that same basic right. outline. I just thought it was cleaned Does up it a little. Does it also get, gets a new transmission? And they did some updating to uh, mm-hmm. the uh, transfer cases. I think it's mm-hmm. the only one in this class that's got a terrain management type yes. uh, system to it. So Which, I thought that was pretty good. The compass being improved last year, I think it helps move it a yeah. little bit further away from the compass, which is good, I guess, mm-hmm. to set models apart. Greg, you were setting uh, land speed records getting around the show. What, what do you think? <laughs> What's on your must-see yeah, list? Yeah, I'll take the classic millennial take here and go over to the Hyundai Veloster. It's Ooh. kind of a quirky little... Technically a four-door, but that's only if you count the hatch. It's still a three-door design. Um, you still got the one door on the driver's side and then two that, on the yeah. – sig- that, that signature aspect. Kind of silly. Um, but it looks it looks bigger, but it, it, it seems like it's just a hair longer. But it, I don't know, there's something about it. Is it the roof that just gives it a bigger look? It's possible. It's, it's a little lower. Yeah. Uh, they basically, like every new car, they, they tweak the proportions because it doesn't – it's not a, a huge departure from the original – but they just learn from what the first one was and say, all right, here's how we can make it better. They make it a little longer and squat it down a little bit. And uh, I think that the the bigger news is probably that they now are bringing over the N um, performance line over to America. So it will be the Hyundai Veloster N, which is uses a two-liter turbo, uh, that, which will be different from the Veloster turbo. This right. one is a two-liter, which will have 275 horsepower. And I think it was pretty cool of Hyundai. Uh, I was reading somewhere that they uh, basically said that we're not trying to make this car something that it isn't. We're not we're not chasing lap times at the Nurburgring. We want something that is approachable for the for the everyday driver. And I think that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, it's a fun little sporty car. I think it's a great offering for the young and the young at heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Something struck me. Do you think? That vehicle, I mean, as much as we love the BMW X1, and there's a new BMW X2 that's even sportier, is is that almost the same size class? I mean, I realize there's a large difference in price and prestige, but it seems like they may be trying to tap into that market a little bit, the small, sporty I won't call them SUVs, even if some people do. But, but it's that uh, somewhere in between yeah, area where not quite a hatchback, not quite an SUV. And, the, and it seems like they're trying to find that same buyer, the younger, maybe urban dweller yeah. who is who likes to get out of the city on the weekend. So you need some space, and right, but they, you still want something that drives. They don't want a Corolla. It's like yeah. the you know, yeah. anti-small sedan crowd. Joe, I understand you've got some blue in your blood. What, uh, <laughs> what uh, basically is I, your must-see from the show? I grew up riding in the bed of a Ford Ranger, and so I'm excited to see the Ranger back. Uh, yeah. I know that this is the, you know, the international Ranger. It's, it's well, very wrong with that. No, it's, it's seven it's, years. Right. It's not you? an American exclusive design, but this one, a 2.3-liter EcoBoost, four-cylinder, 10-speed automatic. We've driven that powertrain combination in, I think, the Mustang, Mustang. and mm-hmm. other and other Ford vehicles have had that. So we know. It's good powertrain. I worry right, what'd you about think? what do you think the look of it? First impression when you saw it. It's it's good to see another small truck. It didn't blow me away, but I thought, yeah, this is this is something that if I was at the show, it seemed like one of the freshest ideas there, bringing back a small truck. So that's why it got my attention. Do you think it has a it has a fairly soft look, okay? Yeah, yeah, Do I you would think say that. it competes more against uh, Colorado or is it competing against say Ridgeline? Hmm. Uh, I'd say in terms of its powertrain, it's more against Colorado, Colorado. But in its looks, it looks more like a Ridgeline competitor because it does look soft. It looks aero. Uh, and you know, soft maybe is a pejorative. I think it looks aero. Key, I mean, we're looking at the FX4, yeah, which is like the off-road version. Right. Where if you go to the Z71 over at Colorado, yeah. that thing looks beefy. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this is. Uh, they're also going to do it in both an extended cab and in the crew cab. The one everybody basically spent most of their time around was the crew cab. I was excited to see it was going to be an extended cab because you get a longer box Mm -hmm. uh i thought i I think it'll do okay yeah you know it's kind of like they're where they're starting from if it's successful they'll you know add powertrains and other things but of course this vehicle is here for one big reason only isn't it joe yes which is 
to show Chevy that they can't no, have the no, market no. to themselves. What comes What's off coming? of this? Oh, well, the Bronco. Which everybody yes. wants to know about. And they didn't show. No, yeah. they didn't show it. No. That's probably either next year or New York or no, something. I, I thought the motivation was just to spite Chevy because they're like, well, we're not going to let GM have the market well, all to themselves. Well, they Toyota. pretty much have. And Toyota. And Toyota. And, Toyota. and, and you know, so there's a some new, market share with this. There's a new frontier coming yeah. as well. So, Ford, you know. Ford had a weird show, and we, uh, John, you and I talked about mm-hmm. this. And the way that they brought out their products, it was um, – we saw the Edge ST, which we haven't talked about, which basically mm-hmm. just uh, the first ST for a SUV in Ford. But they – they revealed that before the show, like right. a couple of days before. So we get up there on Sunday, and then they roll out the rain, the official reveal, the rain, the Ranger and the Mustang Bullet. And then on Monday night, they reveal a teaser away from the show. Just on the press site, they show the GT500, just a teaser video. I just don't and, understand the reasoning behind it. I don't either. And, and they also teased us for the Mach 1, and, Matt, and they're going to use the Mach 1 right. name, use name as an yeah. electric SUV. SUV yeah. And they were all sitting there scratching <laughs> our heads about that. What Can is we going Come up with another name, please. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's one of the most fabled names in, in Mustang lore. Speaking I'm of, surprised there weren't more people upset about the Mach 1 thing. Like, when I heard it's like, Aren't people going to be like offended by this? Yeah, maybe they don't remember. And we're going to take the Mach One name and put it on an electric <laughs> it was a while crossover. Ago. <laughs> well, speaking of the Mustang, yeah. let's talk a little bit about the Bullet. Fiftieth uh, anniversary of the movie. It was so. really cool. Yeah, it was. You know, remember the last Bullet we had? We said that was the most well matched, screwed together Mustang mm-hmm. we had ever driven, mm-hmm. and I can't wait to drive this one. But you got to admit, the star of the show was not the new Bullet, no, it but the it was the car. original the, the McQueen's one, yeah. car mm-hmm. that they couldn't find, and then they found it, and and I was a private owner had it and didn't want to let them have it. And here it comes rolling in with, uh, mm-hmm. of course, McQueen's granddaughter, Molly, uh, yeah, at the wheel. Cool. I wonder really how much cool Ford show. paid that guy to get his car at the show. It probably didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, and it hadn't been restored or anything. It was just it was just to die for. And I have to say, it took most of the attention away from mm-hmm. the new car. It did. But that goes on sale this summer. Yep. Based and on I the can't G- wait to drive Mustang it. GT. So. A little minor uh, Couple more styling skews, yeah. a few more horsepower, 15 more. I just hope so. they did a matching of components as on this one as well as they did on the last one. Because I remember the last one very vividly. We just, we just walked away and said mm-hmm. they finally did a Mustang that feels like yeah. one person did the whole car. Yeah. Mm, um, cool. I'm going to uh, pick as mine the new uh, Silverado. Lots of pickup truck news there. And I could go on about the new Ram 1500 probably for a while too. But I'll tell you. The Silverado surprised me. Number one, it's it's certainly different. Uh, they haven't the last couple of Silverados. You barely could tell them apart from the previous one. This one, they've started pretty much from scratch. Uh, they've they took a very risky. Um, venture of doing a mixed material philosophy instead of going all aluminum in the body like ford they're using aluminum on all of the body panels that move doors and Mm -hmm. trunks and i mean uh, uh, tailgates tailgates and hoods and metal for the rest of it steel and of course that saves them probably a billion dollars from having to retool (laughs) all the factories and a lot of weight there but that wasn't what was most impressive 450 pound weight saving very impressive but the tricks that they did to make it different. The first thing that gets me is they talked about aerodynamics. Yeah, there's spoilers here and there. But up front, at the front bumper, below the lights, are air inlets that channel air directly from the front into the wheel well, knocking down arrows substantially. It's on all models, work truck up. I've never seen anything that sophisticated on trucks. Then you go down the side and you see this nice wavy line down through the front fenders, some real definition Mm -hmm. to the side. You get to the cargo box. Inside the cargo box, they decoupled the inner wall of the cargo box from the wheel well, and that they, they moved the inner walls out. They've got seven inches of more width in the cargo box ahead and behind the wheel wells than they had before. So now their short box carries as much as a mm-hmm. long box. They really did stuff that made this truck more useful. 12 tie downs, and then to cap it all off, because obviously these things are selling as luxury trucks. They did some of the stuff that luxury buyers like. They took the exhaust and made them, you know, integral with the rear fascia, and they even put on the first power tailgate with a remote. Mm -hmm. That may sound like frivolous stuff, but when you look who is buying these, 
I think what they've done is they, they've always been a very good truck to work. I think they're aiming a lot of this new stuff at the Ram, who has been the personal use truck, has been their target. So they've got now like eight trucks to appeal to everyone. I was very and, impressed, not so much with the interior, but certainly with the engineering and what they did with it. In, and, inclu- of course, they're going to have, a, gonna have an inline diesel. Uh, uh, three-liter yeah. diesel. And everybody yeah. knows that, you know, the truck guys really like an inline over yeah. a, a V6. I, I tell you, in a truck bed, that seven inches is huge. That's huge. It's huge. Absolutely yeah. huge. And There's always that wheel oh, well where you can't fit something that's huge. And instead of doing um, rail-mounted cargo boxes like Ram, the Ram boxes, which take up like 500 pounds worth of uh, mm-hmm. uh, cargo, capacity they did an in bed uh plastic box not as durable but you can store a lot in it and it doesn't really take up any floor mm. space or width i th- i really think they they pulled out the stops and wanted to do a really interesting truck and and you know the rumor is there's a um uh, uh, uh more coming in the way of bed materials and right. There's a rumor of a carbon, carbon fiber, fiber prototype and, bed and, out uh, there, maybe out, and maybe the top model or something. So I was pretty impressed. And that, I think it, it looks better. That too. aero system that's you mentioned that's a passive system. There's not like yeah. shutters or anything. No, no, it's just because you line, that's what's really impressive. Right, right through it, and they didn't tell us how much it knocks aero down. But what they're doing, obviously, is they want. Uh, MPG ratings that are superior to everybody else. And so it's gone between Ford's at 30 MPG for the uh, their diesel F-150, and these guys obviously are trying to beat that. It's a good-looking truck, they, too. Yeah. That mm-hmm. styling line, if you're watching the video version of the podcast, that styling line down the side of the truck, uh, I like that. Well, let me throw this out mm-hmm. at, the, at you. What do you think of the styling compared to that in the new Ram? I thought the Ram was more, my personal opinion, and you guys can chime in because we should open it up now. We got yeah. so much more to talk about. I thought Ram was far more conventional. I do think Ram's gone to a slightly softer face, which surprised me. The interior is very uh, nice, but I Ram, like though. the Ram the interior, Tesla, the screen, and their yeah. top the model screen. has that yeah. twelve-inch Tesla-style navigation mm. screen, which is pretty cool. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, what else there? You know, just pipe in. Uh, you know, things that interest you. Um, Things that you thought were standouts. I'm not well, sure gotta, there was you, any wow you, factors. No, you got to talk but. about the, the Mercedes-Benz G-Class. I mean, it's been 40, go right ahead. 40 years Arnold since... Arnold Schwarzenegger did. Yeah, Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger was there for the unveiling. It's been 40 years since it was updated last. And so this um, is like an all-new chassis. Yeah, it's yeah. all-new. All it looks... Yeah. They did. It well, looks. It's, it's softened a lot like on the old ones. It's softened well, on the that, outside. I, it's not as muscular, but I mean, it's that's it, taking the Jeep approach, with, like with the Wrangler. Yeah, like yeah. it's such an icon, you cannot uh, go so too far yeah, with sure. right. with the styling. And I think that's a lot of people said it looks the same, but they weren't really mad that it looks the same. No, yeah. it's a G-class. it looks like two boxes welded together, and that's the whole yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, but the the he- the headlights were certainly modern and distinctive. Yeah, they were. They were still round, but round. they had the inner uh, light bar. You had the well, grab I, handle on the passenger yeah, side. Yeah, I didn't yeah. get a great look at the interior, but I've heard that well, it's, it's much really nicer than the It's a digital, almost, yeah. almost A-pillar to A-pillar digital Kind of like the E-Class type mm-hmm. deal. Yeah. It was very slow. Um, Super but, off-road capable. Was the only part, there's two parts they carried over. One was the door handle, I don't know what the other one was. Well, we, anyway. I mentioned the E-Class, so the uh, E-Coupe, the E-Convertible, and the CLS are getting the uh, Mercedes AMG 53 treatment, which mm-hmm. I guess is the first applications of the 53. Um, so you're, that's now on a 48 volt system. So uh, it's almost a mild hybrid. Yeah, almost a mild <coughs> hybrid. It's using an inline six turbo engine. So we're back in another inline six, and which nice. Mercedes hasn't had for a while, and a lot of people are happy about that. A lot of interesting tech on this: uh, electric auxiliary compressor, an EQ boost, which essentially will just spool up the turbo for you, if I'm correct on understanding it. At low speeds, before you really get that exhaust boost, this will spin up the. Um, the turbo for you, so, you so don't now have you get that thrust turbo early. Lag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which, which is, is Zach just did a right, segment on that. Right, yeah. I'm just editing that this weekend. And Mercedes is the first uh, company to apply that in a production car. Mm-hmm. He drove a prototype Mustang with right. a e booster, they call it. But other mild hybrid stuff. Uh, Greg mentioned the Ram 1500 gets both V6 and V8 get this e torque. Mm-hmm. Mild hybrid system, which I guess is just a belt alternator system, start Similar stop. To what GM, I guess, have. Yeah. But you can still get the Hemi without it. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. well, that's good. Garrett, anything <laughs> else uh, pop out at you? Uh, BMW X2. Talk, that was talk a big about one. that because I really think it's cool. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, I, I was looking at the, the proportions today, and you know, it fits in between the X1 and the X3. 
Um, it's actually it, slightly shorter than it the is. It is. It's yeah. it's a uh, 3.2 inches shorter and 2.8 inches lower than the X1, and 13 inches shorter and six inches lower than the X3. Um, it, you know, it seems like that it's not as boxy as mm-hmm. as you know the other two. I agree. Um, you know, so you're, they're going for more of a you know, a, a raised car experience, it, it seems it, like. You know, I mean, normally when you they would have the even numbers with the next year looking at a, you know, five-door coupe-ish like. Mm-hmm. But it didn't have – it doesn't have quite as fast a roof as some of the others. But, boy, is it up. It's basically a hatchback, folks. A yeah. Hatchback. yeah. yeah. I, but I like even way, more so than the X1. I like the way it looks. The only thing I did not like was on that C-pillar you had the BMW emblem on Really? It. You didn't like that? <sighs> That's so that was too garish for them. Yeah. Mm. Um, let's see the uh, LF1 limitless concept. Uh, I guess that's going to be their new top of the line. Probably um, oh, they showed it with what four seats, but probably the Lexus, it'd probably be a three row yeah. uh, premium uh, SUV. Uh, there's a new Honda Insight based on the Civic. Basically, they're back in the hybrid game, more conventional looking, 50 mile per well, that's gallon. It's been gone for five years, and it's. Uh, it, it basically a Civic hybrid, isn't it? I mean, it basically like, yeah. is. That's what people is, were wondering: yeah. why bring that back instead of like you've got the Civic? Civic why not just yeah. give it a Civic hybrid name? Oh, I think they just. But it looked good. It looked, it looked good. It was nice. attractive. Yeah. Uh, Acura RD, RDX, anyone? I, that was a nice. I, that was kind of a surprise. I don't know if I I didn't know it was going to be there, and it's. It was technically called a prototype, but it's basically uh, that's, that's what thing. it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Looks yeah. Like they're they're yeah. 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 Uh, and they're going to be uh, they're going to have two performance versions of it probably eventually, and they're even talking about a turbo six uh, V six <laughs> coming. So, uh, for the entire Acura lineup, looks like they're trying to get a little more serious ab- about performance. The two prototypes from the Nissan folks: one from Nissan itself, the X Motion concept, a rather Next rogue, Robust maybe the next looking. rogue. Yeah. But it really looked almost like an Xterra yeah. on steroids. Uh, very boxy. Very boxy, yeah. um, kind of brutish. But the one that knocked oh, me out it was, was the Infinity yep. Q Inspiration. What a that beautiful thing was car. Gorgeous. So futuristic what? looking. Oh, yeah. their, nice. their new, yeah. um, you know, obviously going to be their new, um, the new uh, high end yeah. flagship. I don't know how much of what they did to that car, especially down the sides, they can keep for production. But it was a stunner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the pictures I think you'd are have to awesome. walk away. And so, what did everyone think of the Toyota? Avalon? <laughs> I knew you were going to that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you. Demogra- I, I can tell you. It fits the demographic. You know, it that. exists. It That's exists. The- It'll be popular. We <laughs> always say it's their Buick. I just, uh, I didn't think it looked that different, and I thought kind of. It's homely, super Toyota looking. I mean, you, there's yeah. no doubt about it when you see it's a Toyota. I thought the they kind of went with the. Prius Prime style, which <laughs> also references the – I'm talking about the interior yeah. now, which also references the Tesla where they have that long screen on the inside. Yeah. Again, for the demographic, I don't know if that's the hey, smartest Hey, but it does choice. have Apple CarPlay standards. That's what I was – yeah, I was freaking out about that. <laughs> yeah. Thank good for them, finally. Kia Forte, uh, nice little compact. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's better than the one it replaces. Speaking of uh, that class, uh, first impression when you saw the new Volkswagen Jetta, I thought it was – it was, you know, it's it's a nice follow up. But any first impressions when you saw it? Uh, well, it's definitely it's cheaper than the current one. Yeah, that's but, a good thing. You know, no but more look, slab sides. Yeah, yeah. I know. I like some the, sculpture to it, and f- the interior biggest departure on a Volkswagen interior we've seen in a production model. Digital dash uh, arcing around. It's a little roomier inside. Little roomier. It's hard from the press photos and stuff. It's hard to tell a Jetta and a Passat apart. So I think it's good that the new Jetta maybe has a little more of its own personality. I agree. That's a good way to put it. Well, they got to do something to spark compact car sales. Well, that too. Yeah. Down with them and the Forte. So. Yeah. Last but not least, G A C. Gak. <laughs> In case you don't know what they GAC is, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's a uh, it's one of numerous uh, Chinese car companies that have talked about coming to America. They are a premium brand in China, and they are con- they have won awards as being the best quality brand. They sell about a half a million vehicles a year. They are going out and g- signing up dealers as we speak, and they we expect to come to market next year with uh, a midsize SUV is their first one. I think it was the, uh, what, GS8, uh, I believe, 
And then there's also they showed a, a GA4 <coughs> sedan there, and they had a, a Enverge concept with butterfly doors, which was, you know, shows their they want to be an aspirational brand. Mm-hmm. I thought. But there, I heard rumors, and that's all this is, is a rumor, that they're talking about coming in not only with a super long warranty, but just undercutting everybody in price so much that they'll pretty much guarantee some sales. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's that not the marketing way, way to do, to do it. it. Yeah. 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 I, um, will they be the first Chinese brand in the U.S.? Chinese brand. We obviously already have Chinese right. cars. There's Buicks and Volvos that uh, are built in China. It sounds like they're going to be. Or if, if they stick to this time schedule, they've already built an engineering center in Michigan. If they stick, if they're actually on sale a year from now, they probably will be. But that's assuming they get by all the it's, crash requirements, the fuel economy requirements. It's a big task. That's a emissions. big yeah. task. All the emission stuff. Yeah. So, anybody, everybody, want to sum up the show in a word or two before we move on? In my opinion, lots of little models, but there wasn't anything that like stole the show this no, year. So, knock, no, knock your socks off. Yeah, when no. somebody asks you about it, you kind of have to think a couple of seconds before you say, "This is what I thought was the best part of the show." And normally, yeah. at an auto show, you can pretty much pick one right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't feel that way with this show. Yeah. Garrett, you were back uh, here. You saw the information flowing sure, in. I, I would say, you know, still trucks and crossovers are, yeah. are, yeah. are, are a big deal. That's what you saw, Obviously, you know? yeah. yeah. Let's call it the Detroit Truck Show. And that kind of leads us into uh, our lightning round. You know, we were all <clears throat> complaining about the fact that there was nothing, no real surprise at the auto show, except for the Q inspiration from Infinity because we hadn't seen the front end. Everything else, I guess, you know, it was pretty much uh, leaked uh, online leaked. the day before. Well, yeah, leaked or, or put out there. So rather than revealing them at the show, have the manufacturers basically, are they taking the pizzazz away from the show to the extent that for journalists, not for consumers, are they making press days at auto shows uh, irrelevant? What do you think? Who's starting? Uh, I, I, I remember. Seconds, I so. remember ten years ago when the press conferences would start at three, four o'clock. The big three would do them on Sunday, and it would go all day Monday till five p.m. And then even into Tuesday, you know, at mm-hmm. noon they would finish up. It was just jam packed, and it just provided so much excitement and energy, you know, with big reveals and and to have them spread out from Saturday on, and it's like. I don't know. It takes and away a little bit. And be done by two o'clock. Yeah, it'd be done the, by two on, o'clock on, on the fir- on Monday. Yeah, on the first day, Monday. It's like, eh, I think we can get a little more out of it. I agree. I agree. Greg, um, I kind of have a thought that maybe I I think they are going they're going away. Um, it's just so easy to get information out now. Like the problem isn't getting your information to the people who get the information out to the customers. It's the timing. And now maybe automakers see that, like, why bury myself in an auto show when I can do something a month or two before completely separate and get all the attention just on me, which is basically what Silverado did with Mm -hmm. doing it at Texas Motor Speedo, Mm -hmm. Texas Motor Speedway. So, uh, yeah, I think they're trying to get separated from other manufacturers. Garrett, you're a relative newcomer to the automotive business. Mm -hmm. Do you have any observations on this? I I hope that the auto show is the press days do continue because mm-hmm. I think it's exciting to be there and the the leading up to the actual ta-da. Um, I think it's still exciting. I mean, you're making good points that you can, you know, reveal it by yourself and get all the attention. Um, I think for journalists, the the press shows are important because of the people who are there and you can pick up other stories that, is that true. have nothing to do with, with the reveals. You know, so, you know so a lot of key people are in the, in the, right pl- are in the same place. So... Yeah, I have kind of mixed feelings. I hope they do continue. <laughs> Joe? Uh, I feel bad. I'm too young to have really been in the business when the really exciting auto shows happen, like, you know, 90s stuff where they were, like, driving cars through plate glass windows oh, and yeah. stuff like that. So I heard of I'm cows not, coming down, down the street. I, I, I haven't been around long enough to yeah. miss the way things used to be. But I definitely say that the, the, like, leaking stuff on the Internet a week before just doesn't have the same kind of pizzazz. Mm. They need to find a way to... If they're going to reveal stuff, I like the showmanship and mm-hmm. the production yeah. of it, whether yeah, it's like in sh- person yeah, or really on point. the internet. Right. The uh, uh, and you have to see it too. 
I mean, you made the point that if you see the picture, it is, is one thing, but to see it in person, you right. get Touching more of an impression. Touching it, getting in the vehicle. Sure. And yeah. it's not just this show. We've seen this happening for a couple of years sure. now. I was in Frankfurt in <coughs> October, and it was the same situation mm-hmm. there. So, But I, you know, what I spent explained to me is the car companies are saying, hey, I'm, I'm spending all this money for 15 minutes of the press's attention. And like uh, you both said, uh, you know, it's like, why do I want to do that when I can spend less money and have the stage to myself? Mm-hmm. And do it for longer. So right. I'll say, right. Well, now, I mean, everybody has a smartphone now. They could just keep it, actually keep press out of it and just do it for the people buying their cars. And then that reveal will go out on social media everywhere anyway. Yeah, I, don't like that. I don't like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to put us out of a job. Man. I will tell you, it was very cold in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And that leads into our viewer question from the hang from New Jersey. And this is a question we all ask ourselves, I think. He says, I've always been told the warming up your car in winter before driving, uh, don't do it, or you should do it if it's an older car because it can stall uh, if the fluids are frozen, they can't move. I don't know who told you that, uh, but uh, get another opinion. But now I hear you don't need to warm your cars up, especially new ones because it just wastes gas. He's got an 09 and a 15 Honda Civic. Should he be warming them up on the cold days like we've had since before Christmas? No. The only reason he should warm it up is for his heated steering wheel and his heated seats. Or just for his (laughs) heated (laughs) behind. (laughs) Um, You don't need to do that. Start the car up and go. Not with and you, cars. you were we, – we obviously saw this question ahead of time, but you were expounding on it a Well, I mean, more. if you have a 30-year-old car that's carbureted, obviously it's going to be spitting and stuff. And, yes, you need to let that warm up. But, you know, your, your new car that's fuel-injected, no. You but just – isn't it weird, though, that, that that's true? You should, you're wasting fuel, and you're causing undue emissions. And so what comes along that the automakers are now making standard on almost every luxury car? Remote is that, start. You know, remote, remote start. start. Yeah. And I caught myself with uh, one of the vehicles we had here, you know, cranking it up and letting it warm up about 10 minutes before I went out and got in. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, okay, you Mr. Polluter. And, and, I, you were, and I was. I will say that I have become sensitive to that fact where mm-hmm. when I do do that, and I do, I literally from my living room looking at my car, I start thinking about what people think about me doing that. Oh, I, I judge you. Think about, I yeah. would totally yeah. judge you I think if I was I your think neighbor. about other people in my neighborhood seeing me uh, with just, just a plume that, of that smoke coming out. That plume of smoke, he's just wasting yeah. stuff. So, and yeah. ma- I mean, that guy. Yeah, I don't uh, know. I'll say when I, when I start my car on a cold morning, I give it about 15 seconds just to like sometimes it'll come oh, yeah. down from high idle. And then for the first minute or two, I don't like floor it when I pull yeah, out of the parking lot. I just take it. I feel everything's getting kind of like – you know, everything's getting the oil moved yeah. around, getting loose. You have to up. have an understanding of your car so you can, like, literally visualize things going through their <laughs> yeah, compartments. It's like CSI, you know, yeah. like the <laughs> yeah, exactly. engine cutaways. Do it, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I will say with, with EVs and stuff or plug-in hybrids, I don't understand why they can't. And some of them do. You can heat them up while they're still plugged in. I tried to do that with a BMW i3 that we had, I, and I wasn't I smart enough volts, to figure out how to do the it. Volt but does that. A lot of them, I but know, I you can do you it on your add, phone. I think you have to trigger it on your phone. Yeah. Right, like yeah. you can turn your AC well, well, or does, your heat on while well, it's the still. The Volt does, I know that. Right. And I think the uh, the Volt and the Bolt do. But so I don't come trigger. standard with that, though, right? Don't they really only sell, like, the battery? Or is that a, are we talking about something separate here? Because I know they sell battery warmers and like set in uh, colder climates where they sell about plugins. I'm, I'm talking plug-in about being able to turn got, on the thermostat uh-huh. or turn on the HVAC while you're inside and your car is plugged oh, okay. in outside. Yeah, I thought we were and talking you about like actual battery that, on that, on Right, because you kill your ba- if you turn on the heat while you're driving, it kills your battery mm-hmm. range. But if you're still plugged into an outlet, gotcha. it just raises your electric bill. So I think yeah. in the future, everybody's going to be heating up their cars if that they're plug-ins. Sense. So, Mr. Vahang, uh, thanks very much for sending in your question. And uh, basically, I wouldn't warm up my car any more than is necessary unless it's just too cold to get out there. On the other hand, Joe, you made the good point. uh, Don't get out there and kneel the throttle the first time you're coming out of the driveway either. Right, and let the oil get moved around. Or really ever. Just be safe out there, people. Well, yeah. yeah. (laughs) The number one thing you can do in bad conditions is use You don't want anyone getting any tickets or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Do we, Brian? <laughs> Speaking of complaining, rant and raves. Anybody got anything uh, from all this bad weather we've seen and people driving like crazy people and we just got back from the auto show? Anything stick in your craw? Uh, 
people mm. losing their minds over like an inch of snow. But that's an old complaint. It's just yeah. like every school is closed. Every like every everything is closed. Anymore, you know. Except like McDonald's, like you know, it'll be like three feet of snow and they'll still be open. But, but maybe it's good people stay off the roads because <laughs> they don't yeah, know how to drive sure, it back. Right. I guess. Sure. Sure. All right, I think that wraps up this very special edition of our Motorway podcast, where we talked about the 2018 North American International Auto Show. Garrett, Brian, Greg, and Joe, thank you all very much for participating. And I want to thank uh, Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer, who makes us sound uh, better than we should sound, and Bob Mixter, who came up with the whole idea of the podcast in the first place, and for Joe, who produces it and makes sure that our video podcast gets out online. Thanks to all of you out there that have made Motor Week uh, the longest-running automotive magazine on television. We greatly appreciate it. Please watch us on your local public television station and on the Velocity Cable Channel. And if you're someplace and wondering where you can see it, go to our website. We have a new system on there where you can put in your zip code and see our air times in the station near you. And it really works now, folks. It does. It works very well. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I'm John Davis. For all of us at Motor Week, be careful out there. You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.